I think it's the end of the day, and so a lot of us want to go and hit the bars, but uh, me too. So I'll try to see how well we can do this presentation so you enjoy the bar and not drink in distress. So my name is uh, Mohan Venkatraman. I'm the CTO of Chainyard. We are a pretty old blockchain company, almost seven years, and my colleague here, Jijo. And what we will talk today is I got a I got plenty of slides, so I'm going to try and see how I can do it effectively. But this particular uh, thing that I'm sharing with you is not theory. We actually worked with a real estate property company in Kansas, and essentially the whole goal was to see what is the best strategy in order for us to uh, operationalize it. But it's so what what we did is essentially work with them, look at the details. Uh, we looked at all the choices of blockchains that are effective. And so I want to share my experience here of doing it. So there's no right answer or wrong answer because we are constantly going to evaluate uh, how we are, um, constantly evaluate how our solution has been designed and improve upon it. So we are still working with the client and he's still working with his legal and so on. So that's the experience I want to share with you all. I hope you enjoy it. So moving forward, so there are a lot of things that we will go through this particular thing is why blockchain for real estate property management rentals and then uh, how was the, what is the use case about, uh, the basic concepts that we need to know and how did we solution this. Now if you really look at the real estate uh, a portfolio of opportunities, um, you know, there are plenty of things that blockchain can be very useful for like titles, property records. In North Carolina there's a law that uh, at least many states may have this law that you have to have land records for at least 100 years, uh, essentially whether it was used for uh, a, a trash dumps or there was an oil spill or what happened. Then there are others like, you know, dist fractional ownership is taking a lot of traction because people want to invest in real estate. And so they, how, how is the best way for us to invest in a real estate property? that is distributed stake, which means you don't own the property, but you have a stake so that you can earn returns, uh, mortgages, building supply chain, and reinvestment. But all these blockchain use cases may not be very uh, business friendly. The business model may not work because you may not make money. They sound very good on paper. But one use case that we did take with this particular client who came to us with that is about how to manage rentals. So why, why blockchain for the rental property market is there are, you know, rather than talk about the regular advantages of using um, you know, a blockchain, the real advantages for this particular use case are customization. So this particular uh, uh, rental, uh, you know, property management company, they wanted to package and uh, they wanted to package their assets into, uh, you know, into various uh, opportunities for investment. So they can customize it rather than a right or a standard way of uh, uh, real estate investment. The second is transparency. You can actually see the documents that are associated with the property, whether it is investment worth it, uh, what are the returns on rentals, and so on and so forth. So there's full transparency. Third is liquidity, uh, data sharing. Liquidity because you can try tokenize it, and then uh, tokens can be easily swapped for uh, you know, fiat currency or for other tokens. So liquidity is uh, uh, pretty efficient in this. Uh, data sharing, then uh, tokenization and staking. You know, essentially you can stake it into liquidity pools. So the tokens that are there, one can stake into liquidity pools and earn, um, you know, um, uh, what do you call dividends, or you can earn returns on, uh, on staking or even yield farming. Uh, then there is agility because traditional real estate investment, it's very difficult for uh, one to get out of the market because the turnaround time or the cycle time is much more uh, than record keeping. So you got an accurate record of uh, the property, the maintenance records, the, the history of um, uh, what do you call its uh, valuation going up and down in the market. Uh, and lastly, collaboration, which is an opportunity when people are, when builders are turning around homes and uh, you know, uh, remodeling it, re, uh, redoing it, and so on. So you have collaboration between builders, uh, the, the contract laborers, the property owner, and so on and so forth. So there are many different advantages of uh, why blockchain and real estate. 
Now, the use case that we are going to talk about is uh, this is an existing company that is uh, based in Kansas. So what they want, they do a lot of real estate rentals. So one of the issues that they faced is like for every property, they had to go to the bank and then they had to get a loan and for which there is credit checks and so on. And so, so buying property becomes a headache because every time their credit checks uh, and then the ability for the bank to give them a loan to buy the next property and the next property. So what they felt is that tokenization uh, or fractional stake in the properties that they want to acquire might be a better approach. If they allow investors like uh, all of us, the small investor, then probably there's an opportunity for us to invest um, and provide liquidity in acquiring new property. So our goal was to see whether we can leverage um, what do you call tokenization, DeFi, and NFTs as part of the solution, which is the client's interest. So the requirements that were very clear to us was that uh, we don't want to do KYC on this, but we want to deal with accredited investors only, but accreditation or KYC would be done outside our experiment here. Then buy and sell stake with minimum latency, so they want to invest in the, uh, invest in the property, but if the property is not doing well, they want to get out of that market, that rental market. So how quickly can you do that? Compliance with security, reporting, and tax laws. So you do not want to, you want to follow the existing process. So for example, they have to report, uh, they have to have a report to the IRS, or they want to report on taxes, or they want to report on how the investments are doing. So all that should follow the traditional process. So what we want to do is to pull, put a bubble uh, around the solution. So anything inside the bubble will work with tokens, NFTs, and the, and the process of uh, liquidity pools. Anything outside would follow a traditional process, you know, which means paper reporting using the traditional systems. Uh, hot wallets, because they want to easily do transactions, meaning like I have to tokens for a particular property, I want to swap it for tokens of another property or with fiat currency, I should be able to do that with minimum latency. And the last one, last is like coexist with existing investors, because there are senior investors who are used to traditional processes. So everyone does not want to follow the tokenization model. So how can you have both the legacy model as well as the uh, new tokenized model work together? So those were constraints provided to us. So if you look at, so essentially our proof of concept and as well as our strategy was, uh, what is the business model? How does this company make money doing this? Uh, you know, uh, is blockchain really essential? So we have to look at the business model. We wanted to look at the uh, technology architecture, whether we should use a public blockchain or a private blockchain, whether we should use Binance Smart Chain or whether we use Ethereum. Uh, we wanted to also look at the tools, the, the liquidity pool options that are available. Uh, then what is the implementation plan? So we did a strategy study, and as part of the strategy, we also wanted to look at the ability to leverage you know, the, the DeFi contracts that are already available. So if you really look at uh, PancakeSwap or you know, any other um, you know, uh, uh, swapping, uh, Uniswap, they provide you with the contracts which are not changeable. So what are the opportunities for us to extend contracts that are out of the box and yet um, and meet the solution goals. So some of the concepts that we need to be familiar with as part of the solution, I, I, I'm assuming that many of you are familiar with so many different talks going on here, but things like what is an asset? An asset is anything of value, you know, a property like a house or a car, the value of that property can go up or down, so sometimes you may lose out on the value of that asset, or sometimes the asset may gain value. So what are assets? And then there are fungible assets, which means like assets that can be swapped uh, like for like. So one $10 bill is the same as 10 $1 bills. So those are all fungible assets. Um, then you are familiar with what is blockchain, you know what is gas, because in all these solutions, one has to consider gas as part of the transaction costs. Uh, you do have options to choose which type of blockchain, Ethereum, Binance Smart Chain, or any other EVM-based blockchains. Uh, we do know, we want to know what is NFT. I'm, I'm assuming NFTs are uh, something that has been quite talked about here, but non-fungible tokens, that means 
an asset, uh, if, if there is a token, it can only be, uh, it has a unique identity and that it cannot be swapped for another token. So every non-fungible token has a unique identity and um, you cannot swap it for any. So for example, if I lent you my laptop, I need my laptop back. It's a unique laptop. I cannot get another, somebody else's laptop in exchange for what was borrowed from me. Uh, we also know what is a token. A token is a piece of data, but um, essentially it's a piece of data, you know, it, and it contains certain information such as a token ID, a token name, uh, the description of the token, how much can be minted out of that, uh, on that token, uh, and then the business rules associated with that. Uh, liquidity pools, uh, those who are not familiar, uh, there are liquidity pools which are nothing but automatic market makers. Uh, you are familiar with NASDAQ, which is uh, an exchange. These are decentralized exchanges where the market makers are automatic, which means pairs of tokens can be created in a pool, and we will talk more about it. And finally, the wallet. So these are all like essential components, um, essential concepts that we, we must understand before we build solutions that are related to tokenization, DeFi, and NFTs. So... The key, uh, you know, th this is the analysis of the problem. So the way we analyze problems is slightly different from, I think, every company, the way they look at things. So uh, what are the organizations that will be participating in this particular solution? So we have the real estate company, uh, the company that actually um, is, uh, is wanting to do the solution, which is our client. We have property LLCs, and we'll talk. So each property that is there in the market is managed by a separate distinct LLC model, which means it's a separate entity that manages that particular property. <clears throat> then third party KYC, a third party company that will, uh, that will do KYC for us, meaning like uh, accredit the investor. Uh, and, then, uh, and then crypto exchanges, uh, crypto exchanges are like Coinbase uh, from where you have to buy Ethereum for paying gas or BNB for play, you know for paying gas gas and other or exchanging your tokens for uh, your fiat dollars for USDT or other types of tokens. So we need an exchange. So those are all the organizations. Now the personas that are act, that are participating in this particular solution, the property manager. The pro each property has a manager, or maybe a group of properties may have a single property manager. The role of the property manager is to effectively manage that property, collect uh, rentals, convert them into dividends, and then issue them to the investors. Uh, we have the investors. They are the ones who are buying or having a stake in the property, many properties, one property. It can be, uh, or it can be in the holding company. Then there is the renter who actually rents the property and pays, um, uh, pays uh, what do you call the rent, which is converted into earnings. Then you have liquidity pools, and I used a pool here, but a liquidity pool is, uh, is a pool where pairs of tokens are uh, available from investors. So for example, I could put into this pool USDT, comma, some property token, which means it's a pair. That means any time an investor is there, equal values of both those tokens have to be dropped into the pair by the investor. And then borrowers can borrow from this pool by swapping one token for the other. So USDT could be swapped for a property token, or a property token could be swapped back into USDT. So a pool represents a pair of tokens. And, one to you know, and investors have to always invest pairs of tokens of equal value. That means if I put 10 USDTs, I have to put equivalent property tokens as part of the pair. Now swappers can just simply swap. So, People are typically used to going into the crypto exchanges and buying tokens and selling them, right? That's the tr traditional model by which almost I know all the crypto investors do. They go to Coinbase, buy some USDT, uh, buy some Ethereum, and if it goes up in price, uh, you know, they sell it to make some profits. But liquidity pools is the concept by which each one of us can become investors and each one of us can become borrowers. So it's a good Uniswap and PancakeSwap are all good examples of liquidity pools. Then transactions, you know, these are the transactions. Add liquidity into the pool or create a pool. Anybody can create a pool as an investor. Uh, tokenization, swapping one token for another, registering your property, redeeming your tokens, buying and selling, all are transaction types that will work on this. 
And finally, what are the assets that we are dealing with? So we have the property, which is the one that we are going to convert into, uh, that we are going to issue an NFT against. We have LLC tokens and holding company tokens. So now let us look at how this model will work. Now, at any point in time, I'm not making sense. Please feel free to stop me. Um, but let us see how this works, right? So the first step in all this, and I try to animate this, is that you have the holding company. In our case, it is our client. What did our client do? The first thing is they issued prop, you know, holding company tokens. So look at it as a company issuing shares. And I call it HE, you know, holding entity T1 tokens. So those are all tokens. You know, If the holding company thinks that uh, I want to issue $1 million worth of tokens, they will issue one million worth of HET1. So issue entity tokens and also accredit and register investors. So every investor is registered with the holding company. Now what I'm describing is the approach we took based on existing regulations and uh, de-risking our solution. Okay, so don't question me on <laughs> why I did this. It is really because we wanted to de-risk the holding entity as much as possible. But I can give you the reasons why we did that. The next step is for, uh, uh, you know, it's, so there is a property that the holding company wants to buy, right? There is a property in the market they want to buy. So they buy the property and then they incorporate it associated with an LLC. So every property that this company buys, it, give, it, uh, it incorporates a separate LLC to manage that property. Then what happens is they, can, they issue an NFT against that property. Now, the NFT did not play a big role in our solution today, but their idea was that in the future that this property could be floated in the market in the form of tokens, and as the property value goes up, the ownership of the property could change. So that was the intent of issuing an NFT against the property. Then tokenize that property. So now the property value, let us say, uh, you know, they want to issue stakes for investors, right? So if they, want, if they thought they wanted to issue a million tokens, they would issue a million tokens for investors like us to just have a stake in the property so that anything that we earn out of that property can be shared among the stakers. Right. And then, essentially, a property manager is associated with that property, so his role is to collect um, you know, rent and process the dividends. So there are many ways in which the dividends can be processed. He could collect the rent in uh, dollars and then convert it to USDT and then give it to the investors. So there are different models by which you can do this. Now, what happens is the holding company can create a liquidity pool where US dollars uh, into holding company tokens, T1, right? So that is one liquidity pool. So if any of, so once they create the pool, what they would do is they may have a million USDT with equal an amount of T1, T1 tokens for investors to take, right? So if I want to be an investor in this liquidity pool, I would go into Coinbase, buy some USDT with fiat currency. I'm just using Coinbase as an example. And then I would come here as an investor, uh, as a borrower, I can borrow T1 tokens by putting in USDT. You want to learn more about liquidity pools is a good way to learn, or, you know, so if I want to be an investor, I can put equal amount of USDT and T1 tokens, but I don't have T1 tokens, so I can only be a borrower right now. You can also create liquidity pools on the property, so T1, comma T2, that means these tokens, T1 tokens represent the holding entity, and T2 represents this particular property. Now, what is the idea is that if you wanted to invest in this property, you would buy T1 tokens from here, you go to this pool, you drop in T1, and you buy T2. So that's, that's how liquidity pools work, right? And why do you need the exchange? Because you cannot buy USDT. You want to buy USDT by putting in US dollars, so you need exchanges. And so finally, investors are here. So they can invest into this property by dropping in, you know, they can buy T2 to in their T1 tokens here, and they can use the T1 tokens to invest in this property. But liquidity pools are got basically two functions in each liquidity pool. You can add liquidity or you can swap tokens. You can swap T1 for T2 or you can swap T2 for T1. So those are the two functions you have. Or you can add liquidity by dropping the pair of coins of equivalent value into that pool. 
right? So what do investors do? They can buy tokens, any of those tokens. They can add liquidity to the pool. They can swap LLC tokens for fiat currency. So if you, want, if you want to get out of this market, you take all your T1 tokens, put it into this pool, get your USDT, and you can uh, exchange your USDT for fiat currency. So investors can do those things. Or investors can receive dividends in their wallets. So each one of these investors in this particular property have bought a certain amount of T2 tokens. And so when dividends are issued, they will get equal amount of those tokens. You know, basically, if the dividends are paid in dollars, they can go to Coinbase and convert those dollars into USDT. Or, they could, or the corporation could also give them T1 tokens as their dividends. So essentially, that is the model. Right. So the contracts that we had to write in this is, these are all the contracts. So there is, um, there is an investor, so there are rules around investors, how much they can invest. So basically, when you define the business model, you have to be very clear what are the business rules, right? It's not, I mean, minting tokens and exchanging tokens and exchanges are all very easy to do. It's, it's not rocket science. But the real science comes in is what are the business rules? So there are business rules for investors. How many tokens can they buy? How long should they hold on to the tokens before they can, uh, they can redeem it? Uh, rules of, uh, you know, what is the percentage yield they will get for their investment? So those are all rules, so we build it in. Then there are holding company rules, like the holding company contract essentially maintains a registry of the properties that they are buying and what tokens are they issuing. Uh, you know, and then they have rules on LLC. You know, LLC templates, if you're familiar with Ethereum, we use templates as part of the approach to spin up uh, LLC contracts um, and then issuing uh, holding entity tokens. Uh, you know, this holding company manages LLC, so you have LLC manager, which manages all the contracts, each LLC contract. It also manages LLC tokens. It also manages the property template, which describes what the property looks like. And then the DEX consists of, we used PancakeSwap in this particular project. So PancakeSwap gives you the following contracts, okay? If you go to Uniswap, Uniswap has got its own contracts. So you can use the PancakeSwap contracts to create a pair. I said you can create tokens. So you can create a pair of tokens, T1, T2, to create a pool. You can use Pancake Factory, and you can use the Pancake Router. So actually, these three are the main contracts for adding, creating a liquidity pool, and adding liquidity into the pool. So you, so if you were to summarize, and then obviously you have tokenization contracts, you have the ERC-20 for issuing tokens like T1 and T2. You have NFT, uh, which is allowed, which allows you to, uh, what do you call, um, uh, issue an NFT against a property. That is another contract. You have the token template, which allows you to mint different types of tokens. So I use a standard token template to mint T1 token contract, T2 token contract, and so on. And then distribution rules. So how do you distribute the dividends, and how do you distribute uh, whatever you earn out of the, uh, what do you call, um, well, liquidity pools actually give you liquidity tokens based on the amount of investment you do. Or also you can, you can earn uh, what do you call, uh, what is known as yield farming. You can take your tokens and invest in other pools and so on. So there are a lot of things by which you can make more money out of the investment you've done. So these are the contracts that are essentially used in our, in our example. And then these are all the application contracts that we have. We have uh, authentication, the standard password wall, the basic LLC report, the investor report. So I said everything has to behave as though our, um, our model is traditional model. So this works at the holding company level. They print these reports for uh, reporting purposes, tax purposes for investors, and so on. So these are all application components, nothing to do with the contracts. So critical considerations when you build such a solution is uh, smart contracts have to be resilient because you do not want to lose uh, you know, money that has been minted, you want to make sure it is not stolen out of your wallet. So you really have to do good testing of your token contracts and your liquidity pool contracts. The second is your business structure. You've got to completely define how your business structure will look. What are the business rules of the holding company and how many tokens can it issue at the holding company level? 
and then what are the rules, uh, you know, how do you create LLCs for each property, what are the business rules around that, what are the legal regulations around that, and then how many tokens can be issued against each property, what happens if the property suddenly is destroyed by an act of God, or what happens if the property loses value. So you are not always going to make money. You might have invested in a property, but that property could have lost value because of various other reasons, like there was a uh, th there were some unforeseen events in that area, so people do not want to rent the property. So those are the rules that you have to understand and formulate around the business structure. And the business rules, such as if we collected X amount of rent, what is the way by which it is distributed? So how much of it will be, you know, say if, if I collect 100, uh, a rent of, let us say, 100, then how much of it will be withheld by the holding entity? How much of it is going to be withheld by the LLC? How much of it goes to investors? Uh, and then how much of it goes as gas fees? So you've got to have the complete structure of how you would distribute that. And that is built into the contract. Then you have wallet integration. It's not e when you build custom tokens. If you, if you have MetaMask and you go into Coinbase, it is easy to look at all the standard tokens. But if you have minted your own tokens, then you have to know how to integrate your wallet to the token addresses that you have minted. So wallet integration is critical. And finally, governance. So how do you manage all these properties that are part of the holding entity? You know, who are all going to give, you know, who are the ones who make decisions on the business rules associated with this particular solution? So the holding entity cannot make ad hoc, what do you call, rules or regulations around each property or around the whole business model. It has to be collective decision making and what is that government's governance model look like. So these are very critical considerations when you design the solution, but the solution has got a lot of risks, right? When you build, you know, I, I, you know everyone talks very sweetly about DeFi, NFT and stuff like that, but there are a lot of potential risks around that. And what are those risks? So one is, how do you build the solution? What are the key considerations when you start doing business analysis and business uh, and the technical analysis and actually implementing the solution? And then what are the potential risks? So there is impermanent loss. So impermanent loss refers to, the, uh, to a case where, let us say, a liquidity pool is essentially a formula base. So for example, Uniswap, if I want to put a pair of tokens T1 and T2, the way Uniswap works, it's an automatic market maker, which means, and it, it works on a constant principle. T1 star T2 is equal to a constant. That is how liquidity pools work. They are all based on formula. It is not based on an external market report or a market research. So if, a pro if you put a token that is associated with the property into a liquidity pool, its value is going to go up and down based on the supply and demand of each token in that pool and based on that formula. You know, I, I, I'm hopefully I'm making, it, um, uh, I'm making it simple, but if I have two tokens, T1 and T2, in a pool, then the way Uniswap works, for example, or even PancakeSwap is T1 star T2 is equal to a constant. That is how it works. So if you withdraw T1 tokens, then the supply of T2 goes up, and the formula then reprices the price of those tokens. It is based on an algorithmic formula. It is not based on market research, right? I mean, it's not based on market input. So one of the risks is you bought a property, right? And the liquidity pool is constantly pricing it based on a formula, but the property value has gone down. Let us say you, you put a token and the token value is 10 USD. The token value is 10 USD T1 but the property value in the market has increased to 20. The liquidity pool will not reflect that, and you have a loss of $10, right? So that is called impermanent loss. So there is a risk of impermanent loss if you don't design this properly, especially if you create a pool, let us say USDT and Ethereum. USDT is always pegged to $1, so it is not going to be volatile. But Ethereum is going to be so volatile that your investment, sometimes you may have impermanent loss because Ethereum sometimes drops drastically or sometimes increases, and you have a loss of uh, value in your investment. So that is a big issue with liquidity pools, and they are trying to solve that. The second is fee changes. So changes in the fees can always happen with, uh, depending on the blockchain that you use. Protocol upgrades, there are 
new protocols that are coming in, and those protocols may work differently from the way you design the solution. You have security hacks, people get into your wallets, and then you lose your tokens, so you gotta build, you know, you gotta be considerate of this, and unanticipated regulatory changes. What if somebody says, you know, these tokens have to be taxed because they are really considered as real estate securities? So when you model the solution, you have to make sure that these critical pieces are considered and these critical risks are addressed. So, no, so, so that is why you know, our entire POC was to test how do we be resilient against all these considerations and these risks. And everyone has to do that. Otherwise, most of the solutions fail. You know, I mean, I have not seen one successful project in the DeFi space other than borrowing and lending or insurance and stuff like that. But you know the CLCS case, CLCS was a centralized, decentralized exchange, and they went bankrupt. They went bust because they did not securitize or collateralize their, um, their uh, investments for borrowers. So our architecture was pretty straightforward. So we have Web3 application and contracts. So we used, initially we did Binance Smart Chain, and then we tested it on Ethereum. And in this case, the, the uh, swapping, the liquidity pool that we used was Uniswap and PancakeSwap. Both are available. In fact, PancakeSwap is derived from liquidity swap, uh, from uh, Uniswap. And the, the contracts are available publicly, and you can actually program them to create your own pool and your own investment swaps. You have the application API in this, and then the off-chain database to have things like property records. You know, Investors want to see what the property is, where is it located, how much will it give me in terms of rent, and so on and so forth. So all that is stored off-chain. And then obviously you have the user interface, and then you have the MetaMask wallet that is integrated into this. So if I invested in a property, I can see how many T1 tokens I own in that property, or how many, uh, sorry, how many T2 tokens I own in that property, or how many T1 tokens I have with the holding company that I can invest in any of the properties that the holding company has. So if I were to summarize, T1 tokens that are issued at the holding company level are used for investing in any of the properties. So the way this company wanted to work is they wanted to use their own tokens. They wanted to mint their own tokens at the holding entity level, which, which I call T1 tokens. Those tokens can be used to invest in property one, property two, property three. So basically, you will go to a liquidity pool, use the T1 token to swap it for uh, T2 tokens for property two, T3 tokens for property three. So essentially, you can use the holding company tokens. And that is how we build resiliency from impermanent loss. Right, So we don't want the fluctuation of external crypto to affect our investments. So this is our architecture. It, it details out what is happening in each one of the layers. The, the top layer focuses on how do you set up the whole environment. The application manages the property catalog, the property document details, views about each LLC, how is it managing the property, what was the rent collected, how much did investors make uh, on each one of those properties. There are investor views so that they can see their balance at any point in time, or they want to add liquidity or swap their tokens. And then there is a dashboard. And then the contracts are liquidity pool contracts, which are pancake swap or Uniswap. We use these contracts we, out of the box. And then we use tokenization to mint tokens T1, T2. We actually extended the ERC20 and ERC721. So one of the things is like I've used a lot of publicly available tools. And the deficiency in many of these tools is that uh, you know you have to build the rules at the token level so, because if you build the to if you build the rules at the application layer, then somebody coming out from outside anybody can access a token contract if you know that address correct. If I know the address of a token, I can go and interact with that token. So the token has to behave the same way whether you come through Coinbase, whether you come through B you know Binance US or whether you come through the application, its behavior has to be always consistent. And the only way to build consistency into these tokens is when you put the business rules within the token. So the token in our case, T1 and T2, actually have business rules which checks who is asking me to, buy, you know, who is actually wa wanting me to send these tokens. Is it an accredited investor? So those rules are actually built at the extended token level and not into the application. So those were things that we wanted to test. 
The second thing we wanted to test was that we did not want anybody who is not part of the solution to be putting money into the pool. So we didn't want somebody coming in from the external world and putting money into the liquidity pools. So we had to build rules inside these token contracts to say, if you are not a member, if you are not a registered member of this particular entity, holding entity, you cannot add investment into the liquidity pool or you cannot swap. So we had to take those rules and build it right into the contracts of the tokens. So that is very critical consideration if you want your application to behave the same, whether you come through the application, whether you come through a MetaMask interface or another wallet interface, or you directly talk to the token address. And similar potential applications for this kind of a rental, you know, where you want to earn dividends by investing in assets, there are many different applications of the same model. So I can use the same model that I've shown you for investment in private aviation. A friend of mine has seven aircraft, and essentially they have what you call fractional investment. He is a majority shareholder, but the rest of them is tokenized, and basically investors like us have an investment in that aircraft. So if the flight is full, they make money. If the flight is empty, they lose money. But of course, that's a good application of how do you want to uh, you know, create an NFT out of your aircraft, and then how do you want to make sure that you can tokenize the seats or you can tokenize the flight, flight hours, and then investors can have a stake in this aircraft and earn dividends. Car rentals, oil and natural gas, right? Essentially, a rig is usually shared by many different oil drilling companies. So the rig is very important in terms of an asset. You can, token, you can NFT the rig, and you can tokenize the asset, and as the rig is being shared by different oil companies, you can start earning dividends. So dividends can be in the form of tokens, or dividends can be uh, fiat currency converted to USDT and USDD converted into a property token or an asset token. And finally, art and interior decor rentals. So I used to be, you know, in the early days of my career, I had a friend, all he did was buy very expensive artwork and he will go to different homes and he will change their artwork every week. So some of the, some of the folks had rich art in their homes and the reason was he would, they would rent they would rent the wall to him, and he will come and put a different picture every time on their wall. And there would be expensive paintings, and so that's a rental business. So if somebody, want, if somebody had a rich, elegant taste and they wanted different artwork, so the art rental business, art can be tokenized, and then the rental business can give the renters or the stakeholders in that art dividends based on the rentals. With that, you know, Chainyard often follows a methodology that is, uh, tell me when you want to come up, okay? Chainyard always has a methodology. So when we do an assessment of any client, we look at the following things. We look at the business, which means what is the monetization model, what is the funding model, what is the market adoption, because without adoption, your solution will fail. And we look at the legal and compliance rules. So that is our solution approach. So we look at the business, the technology, whether we use public, private, or hybrid, whether the platform, you know, and what kind of a platform or network we want. If you want public, do we go with Hedera, or do we go with Ethereum, or we go with Binance? We also look at the structure of the, of the network and all the technology components. So I told you I'm using pancake swap contracts. We have to look at which contracts we want to leverage out of the box and which contracts we want to extend. And lastly, we look at one-time capital expenses, ongoing operations, and how do we govern, us, uh, you know, govern the solution. So that's our approach, and that's exactly the approach we followed here. And our model for decomposition is to look at various aspects of any solution. So this is the model that we follow for every client. That means when we go into a problem, we do a detailed analysis of all the aspects. So this is the dimensions by which we assess that business case. It is not that we dive straight into chain code or into contracts. We look at what is the business model, the organizations involved, the personas, the assets, the contracts that need to be built, what integrations are required, what are the policies and procedures, audit and compliance requirements, transactions and business events, information, what kind of oracles are needed in terms of getting secure data, what are the application components, uh, what is the portal inf interface that sits on top of the application, and what is the mobile interface that is required, and finally, what kind of an environment are we going to deploy this and how. So this is our approach typically for every, um, 
you can say opportunity. And we have a series of things that we go through within each one of them before we actually design the solution and, and figure out whether it is feasible to build the solution, whether it makes sense or not. With that, I'm going to just give it to Jijo here, who is going to say some things. Come on. Oh, OK, if you, Jijo, you can talk quickly and ask. Yeah, I think, I think we are already time's up. So, so maybe, maybe there's only one line I probably wanted to add that um, Cheney had started a blockchain journey along with Hyperledger in 2015, when Hyperledger was, was being developed at the IBM Labs along with the Linux Foundation. So we got the opportunity to do the testing of the fabric at the labs. And after six years of the journey, I mean, we were not known as Chainyard at that time. We were known as our parent company called IT People Corporation. After six years of our journey, I think uh, the last year, Everest, uh, Everest Group published a report about Chainyard. I mean, they, their assessment metrics out of 23 IT companies, and Chainyard was way up in the top as one of the major contenders on the blockchain services. Right, so I think I will stop at this point, and we do have a product called a Trust Your Supplier, and, and we can stop for a few questions. And uh, Yeah, so I, I think I have this presentation. I saw some of you take pictures, but actually there's a lot more slides that we will read out from the conference. So this presentation... Mohan, let's take a question. Yeah, I think that's what she was going to ask about those new slides. Oh, okay, sure. sure. How long does it take you to set up a, a new... There are people on the virtual audience, so if you can ask the mic. How long does it take you to set one of those um, systems up in regards to helping a client with a new holding company and all the LLCs? How long does it take to get all the information together? So, okay. so what we do typically, and I'm loud enough, is uh, you know, it takes you know, anywhere from four weeks to do, or six weeks to do the, it takes anywhere from four weeks to six weeks to do that assessment and analysis. And typically, if we are doing a, P, we don't do POCs anymore because most of the concepts on blockchain are proven. What we do is proving some of those critical pieces, whether they, they will work or not. So for example, in this, we didn't do a full POC. We wanted to see whether you can make modifications to the, you can extend the token contracts to have the business rules of the LLC and the holding entity. And then, can investors add to the pool? And how does the pool behave when there is permanent, impermanent loss or whatever that is? So to that extent, we built. So this particular thing took us about six weeks, okay, just to prove the, you know, do the assessment based on our approach and to do the POC, which I call proof of feasibility. But normally, if you were to build a solution after that, it is, it is much more easier because we understand what we need to build. So we always have the fundamental, fundamentals laid out. And if the fundamentals are clear, it's a breeze for us to build, depending on the size of the solution. Obviously, sometimes it takes three months to do an MVP, and sometimes it takes 10 weeks to, you know, um, more than three months to build an MVP. But, but over the time, over time, we have built so many applications. A typical assessment for any solution, typical assessment, as I said, strategy development is four to six weeks. And a typical approach for building the solution an MVP is up about three months, and, uh, and then hill one, hill two, to refine that solution based on whether it meets your client goals and the adoption is good, is three, three months of uh, what do you call incremental hills to make the solution robust or, or pro productionize it. So, you know, this, this presentation I have uploaded, so you have all the slides. <laughs> And you have the email address. Obviously, it is a little complicated for me to talk on many different concepts all the time. But in order to do justification that what we built, I think like um, I had to <laughs> skip through a lot of the concepts or muddle it up as I went through. So I hope it was enjoyable and you all had something to learn from our experience. Thank you. <laughs>